Hello and welcome to a brand new edition of Problematic Women. I'm your host, Lauren Evans, and this week I'm coming at you from sunny Florida, not our normal podcast studio, because we are practicing some social distancing. This week, we have a really great interview Virginia did at CPAC with lawyer Harmeet Dillon. She is definitely problematic being a free speech lawyer based out of San Francisco. Next week, we will be back with a more regular show, but stay tuned for Virginia's interview. Looking for a short morning podcast to give you the news of the day without liberal bias? The Daily Signal podcast is a rundown of the top stories you need to know that the mainstream media is probably ignoring. I am joined by Harmeet Dillon, lawyer and First Amendment expert. Harmeet, thank you so much for being here. Happy to be here. I'd like to begin by hearing a little bit of your own story. You were born in India. You moved to America with your family as a child. What was that transition like for you? Well, I was pretty small, um, and this was in the early 1970s when uh, the Vietnam War was going on. America had a shortage of physicians. My father was a doctor, and he had been finishing his orthopedic training in the U.K., and uh, the United States invited us over. And so he completed his training in New York and then decided that he wanted to raise his family in a rural community similar to where we had come from in India, in the Punjab. So I grew up in rural North Carolina. Uh, My father wears a turban and my brother wears a turban, and we were people of faith in a minority community. And it was uh, was a little challenging in the 1970s. We still had the Ku Klux Klan active in rural North Carolina, and the Democrats were the party of discrimination and segregation. And so my parents, when they became citizens, you know, they registered to vote and they've uh, throughout that time impressed on myself and my brother the importance of being active in civil society. And, you know, of course, uh, a lot of our immigrant communities are very focused on academic achievement. And so I went off to Dartmouth when I was 16 years old and, uh, you know, eventually pursued a law career. But I worked at Heritage along the way, actually. Did you really? Yes. My first job after Dartmouth was at the Policy Review magazine, uh, which was then at the Heritage Foundation. It's since moved to the Manhattan Institute, but um, that was for one year between uh, college and law school. Oh, that's wonderful. That's so neat. Wow. So why did you decide to pursue a career in law? It was a free speech issue, actually, that really tipped me in that direction. I was actually pre-med when I went to Dartmouth, and I have a lot of doctors in my family, but I became involved with the Dartmouth Review newspaper and eventually became the editor-in-chief of that paper, and it was probably the most prominent conservative college newspaper in America. My predecessors as editor included Dinesh D'Souza, uh, who also was my predecessor at this magazine at Heritage, and Laura Ingram, so they're both longtime mentors and friends of mine. And at that time, we had something similar to what we have today, which is a real crackdown on conservative speech on campus and an intolerance of it. And myself and my colleagues on the newspaper were discriminated against on the basis of our viewpoints. And in fact, three of my colleagues were actually suspended by Dartmouth for a story that they wrote about a music professor. And so we ended up getting legal support from the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, which back in the 1980s still cared about free speech for everybody. And as a result of that litigation, we won this lawsuit. And so I was very active in that case and very active in the media representing the views of the conservative students at Dartmouth. And that really sparked in me an interest in going into law and um, using the law to affect social change, uh, among other things. Let's talk a little bit more about college campuses, because we are seeing that they're, they're such a battleground, yes. really, for free speech. What, what is the danger of things like free speech zones on college campuses? Well, free speech zones are really unconstitutional at public schools. And some states like California actually have statutes that apply the First Amendment to private schools as well. And so... Um, the concept, just it's just like gun rights, the concept that you need a license to exercise your Bill of Rights, um, guaranteed rights that are, you know, really spring from our natural rights as men and women is antithetical to the words in the Constitution. And so the role of uh, lawyers who take on these free speech restrictions on uh, particularly our public school campuses is to really one by one dismantle these barriers to freedom. Uh, I have sued the University of California, Berkeley, uh, two years ago on behalf of Young America's Foundation to prevent them from applying unlawful 
security fees and other restrictions to conservative speakers that they did not apply to liberal speakers. And, you know, you'd be surprised in today's day and age, university administrators think that is perfectly okay. They get away with it because we don't have an army of lawyers, unfortunately, ready to defend the rights of uh, high school students and college students who suffer this type of discrimination. Now, in that lawsuit, we were successful, and the lawsuit has resulted in University of California Berkeley reaching a settlement that paid some of the attorney's fees, but also, more importantly, took down that barrier. And now, uh, in most cases, no student group will have to pay a security fee to bring a speaker to the campus. And so I'm really proud of that, and I hope that through this type of effort we can make sure that we have more freedom on campuses for all students, not just for uh, students of a conservative viewpoint that I happen to have. Yeah, absolutely. What do you see right now as one of the greatest threats to America's First Amendment rights? It's really the so-called progressivism. You know, when I was young, it used to be the American Civil Liberties Union, other liberal organizations that fought for the rights of all Americans to be free in their property rights, in their voting rights, in their speech rights, in their exercise of liberty in general. But today, it is actually the American left that is the most restrictive of these rights. You know, the right to life is a very basic life that is really being restricted by the left. And so today it is up to, you know, more traditional constitutionalists to really enforce the Constitution in in favor of liberty and the choice and the right of Americans to be free from government interference. I think that is uh, really uh, critical. We have seen uh, every time we have certain ideologies take over, we have We have a chance of a socialist becoming the major party nominee in in America, and I think that the fact that that is popular in America is deeply concerning because it affects us at every turn, whether it's regulation of hair salon braiders, whether it is restrictions on your use of your property. In, In Berkeley, where I live in California, there's a city council ordinance now to allow renters right of first refusal on purchasing property and then allow public housing activist groups the second right of refusal. So that effectively really significantly limits the rights of property owners. So these types of restrictions and limitations and takings of our rights and our property is really going on throughout various levels of American society. So for people who don't have a background in law, they might be a young person on a college campus or even a high school, and and they're kind of seeing you know, these restrictions pop up and they're being told, you can't say that, you can't do that, you can't pray, this, that. Yes. What can they do? Well, I started a nonprofit last year called Center for American Liberty. And that group is, among other things, uh, fighting for the rights of uh, American college students to have freedom on their campuses and, and among other rights. There are some other groups that do this as well, on a, also on a nonpartisan basis. Uh, FIRE is an organization that does that. Alliance Defending Freedom is another nonprofit that does this work. But we're really doing it from a secular and um, nonpartisan perspective. You have been very successful in your career as a lawyer. Who are some of those people that have really inspired you and pushed you forward in your own career and in your life? Well, it's interesting. I think young women today um, are in a very confusing world. On the one hand, um, we have the transgender movement, which is allowing uh, boys to come in and take our spots in our sports title nine world which was you know built as a way for women to be able to have equal access to uh, athletic opportunities so that's very confusing you know women are also taught that uh, if, if they don't see somebody like them in gender or in race represented in their organization or in their uh, corporation that it's unequal. In my life, the early mentors of mine included a African-American mathematics teacher in my middle school in rural North Carolina who taught me girls can be good at math and, you know, you don't need to be playing with dolls or going into home ec. You can do that. And that was a big deal for me. But my big mentor in, in my law practice was a male a person, didn't share my faith or my political views. But he happened to share my uh, ancient Greek and Latin teaching in college and uh, was a great mentor to me of ethics, professionalism, zealous advocacy, and so forth. So as a woman, um, I have all kinds of people working for me in my law firm, and I try to be a mentor to all of them and encourage them to be what's best for them and not push them in a particular mold. Unfortunately, law is a very sort of left-oriented profession in terms of statistics. And so being a conservative lawyer is a fairly rare thing. And being somebody who's out front on some of these civil rights and civil liberties issues is is quite difficult in San Francisco, a very, very uh, left jurisdiction. 
So what would you say to a young woman who is thinking, wow, you know, I've thought about law. I don't know if it's for me, but I'm, I'm really passionate about yes. freedom. I'm really passionate about protecting people's rights. What would you say to That's her? That's a great question. So a lot of people go into the law profession because they don't know what else to do after <laughs> college. And college is a very artificial and really coddling and unrealistic environment. I'm surprised in today's day and age with the cost of college, the number of students who are graduating with gender studies or, you know, political science degrees, which are really fairly useless. They don't provide you with any skills. So, um, and I'm, I'm one to talk. I majored in ancient Greek and Latin, but I had a, <laughs> I had a focus. I also did organic chemistry and I also could have gone into medicine if I wanted. But I think that it's a mistake for people to go into law school right after college. I think it is a great idea to go work in the legal profession for a year or two years to see if you like it. And to give an example, in my immediate family, between my siblings and my first cousins, I think five of us have law degrees. I'm the only one practicing law. So those hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of degrees have actually maybe gone for naught in a way. Now, it is great training, but I think one should make sure they're passionate about either being a lawyer or pursuing a career where a law degree is helpful in order to do that because it is very expensive. It is three years of your life, and if you're not really into it, it might be better to spend those three years and those hundreds of thousands of dollars on something that you really do care about. Uh, the great thing about America, and I say this as a woman from a uh, country, India, where um, although it is a democracy, people are not equal. Uh, people are very much stratified on the basis of their gender, their caste, their religion, their, their race, where they came from. And we don't have that in America. Any girl can grow up to be anything, can be president, can be on the Supreme Court, can be the partner or head of a law firm, can be a politician, a business owner, uh, you name it, a woman can do it. And so that gives us a lot of choices. And so I think women should avoid the temptation to be pushed into a role by their family, by their partner, and really make those choices for themselves. And then take the time to do that. Uh, I think uh, my year at Heritage was certainly useful to show me I didn't want to be a journalist, for example. Um, I actually like taking sides and being an advocate. And 27 years into that decision, I'm very happy that I chose the law profession. I think it is very powerful. Any lawyer with a law degree can go into a court and vindicates the rights of a citizen. And over the years, I've helped women victims of domestic violence escape violent situations. I've helped religious liberties plaintiffs vindicate their rights to practice in their faith and have their jobs or their education as they like. I've helped conservative students and uh, union members vindicate their free speech rights in the workplace and in the campus. I've helped workers at big tech companies fight against oppressive uh, HR policies. And um, I'm continuing to fight in many different ways. And so um, what is unique about being a woman, I guess, is I feel like... Um, I feel like women are very good at multitasking. And as a business owner and somebody involved in politics and public policy and in the media, uh, I am constantly juggling different things. And, um, you know, we, are, we have that training or that innate skill to be able to be different things at different times of the day, yeah. which I think guys are a little harder to, for them to do that. Yeah, yeah. So we love to ask everyone who comes on the show whether or not they consider themselves a feminist. Um, I think it depends on what your definition of feminist is. I am a woman who believes a woman can be and do anything. I do not believe in gender roles. Um, and so I think, yes, in a way, I believe in women's empowerment. Uh, but if that means signing on to a agenda that includes, um, um, you know, so many different things that are identified with feminism, abortion rights, rejecting traditional marriage, and many other things, I reject those things. I'm happily married, and I very much treasure the family and traditional roles in that regard. But you know, within that, I'm also a business owner. And to me, being a feminist in practice means that the, the people who work for me who are women, um, making sure I respect their family lives. And I, you know, so I have a coworker who um, has a lot of flex, both male and female coworkers have a lot of flexibility to be parents and work from home and take care of their kids when they have to. I think that is true feminism is recognizing and nurturing people being their whole selves. I love that. So good. Harmeet, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right, that's going to be it for this week's edition of Problematic Women. Stay tuned next Thursday for a new episode featuring Virginia and I. We'll both be at our homes, but we'll make sure we'll get you really great content. In the meantime, conservatives need your support in the podcast space, so please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
it really does make a difference. So make sure you're being safe, you're taking precautions, you're looking out for the elderly and vulnerable in your life, and have a great week. Problematic Women is brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. It is a product of The Daily Signal produced by Kelsey Bowler, Lauren Evans, and Virginia Allen. Special thanks to our editor-in-chief, Katrina Trinko. We produce Problematic Women in remembrance of our dear friend and former co-host, Bree Payton.